Dr. Haywood Joyner Jr., an educator in central Louisiana, at one time acting chancellor of Louisiana State University at Alexandria, and currently chairman of the Allied Health Department, received a high honor from Angola Prison and shares his insights into what protects young people from winding up at the famed, feared Angola prison. Baransu Balance Podcast with Dr. Ince emphasizes the interdependence and importance of a healthy mind, body, and soul. Hello. Welcome, Dr. Haywood Joyner, Jr. Thank you. Delighted to be here today. I am so happy to um, finally meet you. I've been trying to get a hold of you for this interview for a while, and I really appreciate it. So I want to start off with an honor that I saw that you were inducted into the Louisiana Justice Hall of Fame, located at the Angola Museum, just outside the gates of Angola Prison. Congratulations. Now, when I think of Angola, I think of it as, you know, one of the largest prison systems, the bloodiest prison system, and and um, generally not a lot of good things, scary things, no air conditioning. I understand that they recently um, are getting rid of the, the um, juvenile section of the prison. But, uh, which brings me to my first question. How does violence, and more specifically, gun violence, affect our society today? Well, thank you for that question. And it was certainly an honor for me to be inducted into the Louisiana Justice Hall of Fame. That was something that I never would have thought that would have occurred in my life. And uh, as you described Angola, those were certainly the same things that I had in my mind when we were invited to go down to Angola to accept the this award. Uh, but when you look at gun violence, if we 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 really look at it, it's certainly an issue, especially here in the central Louisiana area. There's a lot of gun violence almost every weekend. We seem to see that there is a young person and it's really uh, it's really you know, something that I'm saddened about. Yeah, it, it, almost so doesn't, it almost people. doesn't make the front page news anymore. Right. That is so correct. It's such mm-hmm. a it's such an everyday occurrence now. And it is an issue within our city, within our state and our nation. And I would dare say probably in a lot of places around the world. But I think when we look at gun violence, I think we have to go back and look at it from a cause and effect standpoint. You know, okay. why, are, why are these young people, you know, going through the, this particular stage in life? And I think there are several, you know, factors that are contributing to what we're seeing today. And I think most of that comes from the type of environment that a lot of these young people are growing up in. You know, we had produced a number of years ago a generation of young people who did not have the parenting skills And because of not having parenting skills, they were trying to raise children. And those children were not raised in environments that were conducive to continuing their education, et cetera. And I think that may have been one of the causes. So I would look at the type of environment that an individual is raised in. I would also look at following that the level of education that that individual has. When you look at the Bureau of Justice Statistics, it states that about 69% of jail inmates are high school dropouts. So you have to go back, you have to go back and look at that level of education as possibly being a contributing factor to not only gun violence, but to other crimes that we are experiencing, you know, in our city, our nation, our state today. So so you're saying that it, um, the conditions in the home are contributing factors to um, the the gun violence. Uh, I I saw a statistic that at least for the decade 2020 through 
2010 through 2020 that Louisiana, my home state, was number one in a homicide rate. But I believe that there have been strides towards improvement. But And so you're saying that it's the conditions in the home you believe that is the... Um, you know, the, one the of beginnings the of this one, cycle one of, the of violence. Factors. Right. And and what, I, what I'm looking at, there are a number of factors there. And as I alluded to, you know, we had a generation where we had young people raising young people. So mm -hmm. the parenting skills were not there. In a lot of our communities, you have the absence of the male factor within the home. You know, that should not be something that contributes to a person committing a crime, though. Even the environment that you grew up in and whether or not the dad, the male is in the home or not. You know, there are other uh, individuals within the community. And thank God for grandparents. You know, grandparents <laughs> yeah. in many instances have raised a lot of, of children and those children have gone on to become successful. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the family from the standpoint of their socioeconomic status, you know, if the individuals that were raising those children were, uh, from, were from a low socioeconomic uh, home, uh, low income home, then that child grew up in that particular environment. And that had that put certain stressors, I believe, on that young person. And that young person is more likely to be a dropout than an individual who grows up in a home of a higher you know, socioeconomic status. Right. So there, so there are a number I, of factors that are going to contribute. So, um, so you're saying that poverty, or um, is definitely a contributing factor. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw another statistic. At one point, Louisiana was 49th in a rate of poverty in in the United States. Um, the the um, Angola uh, prison system has attempted a reform in the judicial system that may help people stay out of prison. But um, yeah, so I, I would agree, you know, but when you look at the environment, you look at the level of education. And, and if I could introduce one other factor that I believe is a contributor, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at the involvement of that young individual, you know, within community activities, within school activities, within, you know, activities within, within their church, et cetera. I knew that when I was growing up, you know, my, my mom was a lunchroom manager. My dad was a school bus driver and he had an okay. upholstered shop on, on the side, you know, mm -hmm. but when, when, when I look at that, they had an interest in us completing our education. You know, and that was a major factor. And they made sure that we were also involved in activities within our communities. And I don't think we see a lot of that from the standpoint of, of young people being able to get involved in community organizations where they work closely with other young people and they don't have that opportunity to, you know, the, the, my, my grandma would say, you know, an idle, man, an idle mind is a devil's workshop. You know, the busier you can keep a young person, I think the more likely you are to keep them out of trouble. So when I was growing up, and I'm thankful that, that I was a Boy Scout. Okay. And so that was one of the contributing factors that I think helped me. Mm -hmm. I also was involved in summer league baseball, you know, programs okay. like that. Mm -hmm. So I stayed busy in the summer. So mm -hmm. I, I grew up in a small community and there were opportunities certainly within that community for me to get in trouble. But I was kept busy. At home, I was kept busy. I had to cut the yard. I was a, more the yard, those things. Yeah, I was involved in community activities. So I think in addition to the environment that you grew up in, the level of education, the level of involvement of the young person within activities within their community, within their church, involvement with other family members, I think those are factors also. Okay. So if I were to say that we're going to address those issues, then we would address those problems. You know, so organization, organizations like the Boy Scouts, uh, a church, uh, work programs for students, and mm -hmm. um, are all helpful, like you said, to keep young people busy. And, right. and keep um, the mind active, you know. Uh, right. If they, if they in a idle, good way. They're more likely to find things to, you know, that to, can get them in trouble. 
Okay. You know, I grew up in a very, very small community, you know, and, and yeah, the people that surrounded us in that small community, I think, were a big help. You know, they, they weren't members of my family. But mm -hmm. if I was doing something that was wrong, that person knew that they could correct me and that my parents would not be upset if they corrected me. I remember my dad and that I mentioned to him before he passed, he couldn't do this today. There were a couple of young men that lived on Bayou Rapids, which is a rural area around Alexandria Boyce. They got in an argument on the bus. He stopped the bus, put them off, made them walk home. <laughs> and he okay. got to the parents' house and he told the parents, they were sitting on the porch waiting for the, the kids to come home. Mm -hmm. He told them they got in an argument. I put them off the bus so they'll be here shortly. They're walking. And the parents said, thank you. We'll take care of it when you when they get home. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but you can't do that today. You probably end up in jail you know, if you do <laughs> something like that today. Okay. So uh, a, a, a tight community. And um, so you are definitely Dr. Joyner and educator. And that was the, um, you know, the reason for your award, over 40 years in education. At one point, the interim chancellor of our local Louisiana State University uh, at Alexandria. So I want to, and you've, you've already uh, kind of alluded to this, but I want to know, do you feel that education is the key, uh, one way to success? And I'll put that in quotes, success and can you give a story or two to back up your view? The uh, slightly uh, background to this is that it seems like post pandemic, our colleges are losing um, students, students. Uh, minorities, men, uh, just all the way around. And we're told that maybe college is not worth it. And so I just wanted your uh, uh, opinion about that. <laughs> Well, I certainly do believe that education is one way to success. And, and the reason I'm saying that, and I alluded to it earlier, I grew up in a very, very small community, the town of Boyce, Louisiana. It is about 14 miles northwest of Alexandria. My high school graduating class had six graduates in it, six graduates. And there were some graduates prior to my class that had two graduates. OK, so growing up in that small, small community, when we look at Boyce, when we look at a little community that's called Taylor Hill, that's just north of Boyce or Lena, that's just north of Boyce. I look back on that every time we have a class reunion or a high school reunion. I look back at the number of individuals who have succeeded. You know, we have doctors, we have lawyers, we have med lab scientists, we have nurses. We have hospital administrators. We have radiologic technologists, uh, other healthcare professionals, preachers, teachers. You know that have come out of that small community and those small that small school. As a matter of fact, if you are a sports fan, uh, Coach Charles Smith, who is the basketball coach at Peabody High School, is the winningest coach in the state of Louisiana for high school basketball. And that young man came from Lena, Louisiana, and okay. is a graduate of A. Wettermark High School, which was formerly located in Boyce. And just this past weekend, he was inducted into the Naismith Hall of Fame, Basketball Hall of Fame. Wow. He's also in the Louisiana Hall of Fame. So education is what got all of us that grew up in that small community to where we are today. Education and a parents who surrounded us, teachers who surrounded us and were concerned about our future, those are the things that got us to where we are today. Had it not been for those teachers who were concerned, the, the love of people within our community who wanted to see us succeed, I don't think any of us would be where we are today. So I am a prime example, you know, of what education can do for an individual. So. I am 100% sure that education is one of the contributing factors to success of an individual. The proof is there in my small community. Yes, and as, as a physician, um, I look at the statistics. Uh, the, the, actually, the more education you have, the better that you'll be off as far as your health, whether it's because you can afford the health insurance 
or you have more information available or able to, um, you know, live near more hiking trails. So right, right. In, All the, of those are in the olden days, we, we would consider it a, um, a setback living in the country, but now we're finding that it's healthy for you. It is, certainly is. I, I'm proud that I grew up in that small community, you know, um, and, and I decided to move back. And my brother, who's a medical doctor, he decided to move back. My sister, who was a medical laboratory uh, scientist, she decided to move back. But none of our grandkids, none of our children or grandchildren decided to move back to that small community, you know, but uh, hmm. we are thankful for the having had the opportunity to grow up in a close knit community like that. Okay. And uh, if you in that same community now, if you look at the individuals who did not have or did not take advantage of mm -hmm. the the uh, education within that community, we can go back and look at a number of those individuals who did get in trouble, who did end up in jail, who did end up even at Angola, you know, but they did not grow up in the same type of environment that people my age grew up in. But I am committed to the young people of our area. You know, one of the things that I hope to do as I go into retirement is to give back to the community by working with the young people within our community to afford them opportunities that I had to let them know that I'm someone who cares about their future and whatever I can do in order to help them get to where they want to be in life. That's what I want to dedicate the rest of my life to doing. That's absolutely beautiful, Dr. Joyner. So one of, our, my, one of my podcasts was in, entitled, Where Have the College Men Gone? Again, in your role as uh, chairman of the Allied Health Department at uh, currently, that's your current title, at uh, LSUA, I, I read somewhere that you have specifically reached out to young men. And tell me a little bit, about your efforts and why you think it's important? When we look at all of our allied health programs that are offered at LSUA, and we have a large number of them, we have nursing, we have medical laboratory science, we have healthcare administration, medical imaging, all of these different programs, they are all female dominated. Mm -hmm. So one of our goals here at LSUA, and I can also bring in Central Louisiana Technical Community College, one of the goals of these institutions is to try and attract more men into the health professions. And uh, there are a number of ways that we do that. Both the community college and LSUA are recipients of Carl Perkins funds. And one of the one of the goals of the Perkins grant is to attract more men into the programs that are Carl Perkins eligible. So we have formed an organization here on the campus of LSUA that is designed to bring young men on our campus into meetings periodically to talk about professions that are open to men if they choose to go that particular route. For many years, men thought that nursing was a profession for women. But we are finding out now in the hospital setting that men are really needed in nursing. You know, and we're putting forth every effort that we can to do that. I'm also a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, our local Epsilon Psi Lambda chapter. We have a program that is called Alpha Ambassadors, and mm -hmm. we meet monthly with young men within our community. And we, we do activities with these young men to talk to them about careers that are out there, et cetera, and try and get them interested in going into what are called non-traditional fields you know, for men. So we have a number of, of strategic efforts that we are involved with to try and get more men involved in, in the health professions, and, and, et cetera. So what do you think There's that some of the barriers for these young men in um, entering like the nursing field is it their um, I, prep before they get to the college level, or is it because they don't want to I, be I think in this so-called female I, field? Um, to me, I think it's both. money is, is, it should be an incentive. I shouldn't say should be. Uh, many times is an incentive. 
uh, and the nursing field is a pretty stable way of, of making a decent living. So what are the obstacles? I, I think the obstacles that we as men put in place are, you know, things that we put there ourselves. You know, the first thing was that nursing is a female profession. You know, I don't want to be a nurse. That's what that's what females do. So that that was one of the main barriers. But oh. I think now okay. uh, I think men are seeing that it's a stable profession. There is a need, you know, for men. And we found out that most of our male graduates want to work in the emergency room. They want to be huh. an ER nurse. And that's fine. You know, uh, there are positions all over the hospital for them. But when it comes to financial barriers, that was at one time a barrier. But here at LSUA, we have through the Rapids Foundation now scholarships that are available to anyone who's interested in going into the field of nursing. Okay. We have another program here that we are trying to attract men into, and it's uh, long term care administration. You know, that's a, a field that is wide open. But with COVID, nursing homes got kind of a bad rap. So we're having difficulty now attracting males and females into that mm -hmm. particular career choice. But I think a lot of the, the preparation for it, um, sometimes men don't take the appropriate courses in college if they want to go uh, one of the health professions route. So we have advisors now, professional advisors that are working with the students when they come in as freshmen to let them know these are the courses that you need if you want to go into one of these fields. We have dual enrollment courses that we're offering in the high schools. We have an introduction to the healthcare system where we talk with the young men and the young women in the high school classes. These are professions that are open to you, to the men. These are predominantly female, but there are openings here now for males in these professions. And there's certainly things that you want to consider. And the salaries are very good. So it's a very good way for a man to support his family. Right. And it's not just nursing, but um, med, med tech. Um, right. All the health professions, basically. Right. Yeah, all of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Dr. Joyner, you are known for giving back to your community. Uh, do you have any last words of advice for our younger listeners? The importance of being involved in your community or... I would say that to the young people who may be listening today that service is the ultimate calling in life. You know, it's not all about what you gain in life, but it's about what you give back. One of my favorite sayings, and I'll quote it for you, if I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody that he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. And I live by that on a daily basis. It's not what I get every day. But it's what I can do to give back. And that's one of the reasons I chose health care as a profession, because it's a serving profession. And I was fortunate enough to get into education, which is another profession where I can give back, where I can serve. So I would admonish young people to look for opportunities to be of service to your community, to your church, to your family. Look for opportunities to give back, because the world that will exist tomorrow depends upon this young generation does today because they are, you know, the world of tomorrow, you know, and, and I'm hoping that we can get them involved enough so that we can do away with all of the violence, the gun violence, et cetera, that we started off initially with, that we can do away with all of those things and we can make the world a better place for all of us to live, to work, to play and to thrive. You know, so, so I, I'm sold on helping people, on helping others. I, I, I heard that someone says we want our children not to just s survive, but to thrive. To thrive. That's that's so true. So true. Okay. So I understand that you are a singer as well. Uh, sometimes I say I make a joyful noise. I don't know about the singing part, <laughs> but I did have an opportunity when I was a student at Grambling to, to sing with a group called the Newtones. And we okay. had a record that was uh, published back in that day called 
skate Philly dog. There were two dances there, one called the skate, one called the Philly dog. Of course, I can't do either of those now, but uh, I enjoyed my time. I was also a member of the Grambling Concert Choir. In fact, I served as president of the Grambling Concert Choir. So can you, I like can music. Can you, can you uh, take us out with just one line, just one line of if I can help someone along the way? Sure. You want to do that now? Yes. You ready? Okay. <laughs> if I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word, a song, if I can show somebody that he's traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. Thank you so much. Thank oh, you. wow. You have Thank made you. my day on this uh, special, special day. Really appreciate you. Until we meet again, if I can Thank help you. someone. Thank you. I've enjoyed the opportunity. Along the way. Thank you. I love Dr. Joyner's story from rural Louisiana to academic leader and professor, and back to his hometown that nurtured his upbringing. Dr. Joyner's advice to prevent pipeline to Angola prison or worse is number one, family support. Number two, community and church support through organized activities for young people. Number three, education. He lives by his motto, if I can help someone along the way. This is Dr. Christine Ince wishing you a balanced mind, body, and soul. <laughs>